Good afternoon. Welcome to this broadcast of the National Center for Padre Pio. Uh, today's a special broadcast that we're doing about the Divine Mercy Images, and it's called the Divine Mercy Images, Why Are There Two? And it's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, there's actually three that are so-called um, approved for display in churches and for dissemination to the faithful. But uh, there's two that I think are most familiar to most viewers. Uh, there could be a third depending on where you are in the world. So let me show you a few of these. I think the easiest way to do this is uh, with the iPad. So the first image that we're going to talk about is this one here. This is referred to as the Volinius image. And we'll get more to that in a second. The second one, when I talk about why are there two that so many of us are used to seeing in the United States and also in Europe, um, this one was painted by an artist named, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up my images. This one was painted by an artist named Adolf Hyla. So it's referred to as the Hyla image. And then there's a third one that some of you will look at and say, well, of course, you should have known about this third one. This is, this is the one we all look at. This is known as the Skemp image. This was painted by an artist named Robert Skemp. So we're gonna start in talking about the first one because uh, this is the one that St. Faustina herself, it's the only one actually that she would have seen. Okay, so again, this image is referred to as the Volinius image, and it is because it originated in the town of Volinius in Lithuania. Again, all three of these images uh, have ecclesial approval for display in churches and for veneration. So as you'll come to see, one is not, you know, quote, better than the other, it kind of comes down to personal opinion, but what we'll read and we'll learn about what Faustina, um, what she received from Jesus, the image that she saw and what she wanted it to look like when she commissioned it. And then you can kind of decide for yourself which artist did the best job in doing that. Um, in a letter, so St. Faustina had a confessor. His name was Blessed uh, Father Michael Sopochko, S-O-P-O-C-K-O. And uh, we know from, we have a lot that was recorded in Faustina's diaries, but also uh, Father Sapochko himself, he lived much longer than St. Faustina. Um, so in a letter he wrote in 1958, he gave a thorough description of the efforts to fulfill Christ's request in having this image done. The long letter translated from Polish, um, and it's quoted almost entirely, the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, or the Marians of the Immaculate Conception in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, they have uh, a book, and it's called Pillars of Fire in My Soul, The Spirituality of St. Faustina. It's edited by Dr. Robert Stackpole, STD, and in that, there we go, and in that, um, he gives a, he gives an edited version because it's translated, um, but this is what Father Sopochko had to say. He said, the image represents Christ in a walking posture against a dark background, in a white garment girdled by a band, a belt or a cincture. With the right hand raised to the height of the shoulder, he is blessing. And with the left one with two fingers, he is opening the garment somewhat in the area of the heart. The heart is not visible. From which are coming out rays. On the viewer's right, a ray, a pale, colorless one, and on the left, a red one in various directions, but principally toward the viewer. Sister Faustina called attention to this, that the right hand not be raised above the shoulder, not to bend forward, and only place the left foot forward to indicate movement, that the garment be long and somewhat fallen into folds at the bottom, that the Lord Jesus's gaze be directed a bit toward the bottom, as it happens when standing, one looks at a point on the ground a few steps away, that the expression of the face of Jesus be gracious and merciful, that the fingers of the right hand be upright or erect and freely lie close together, and on the left hand, that the thumb and index fingers hold open the garment, that the rays not be like ribbons or bands hanging down toward the ground, but that with intermittent broken strips or streaks, they be directed toward the viewer and lightly to the sides, coloring to a certain degree the hands and surrounding objects, that these rays be transparent in such a way 
that through them the band, the belt, or the cincture, and the garment are visible, that the saturation of the rays with redness and whiteness be greatest at the source in the area of the heart, and then slowly diminish and vanish, dissolve, or fade away. So that is the description that Faustina gave to Father Sapochko. So this image here, this one we're looking at here that you could call the original image, they're referred to as the uh, Vilnius Divine Mercy image, is painted by um, a painter named Eugene Kazimierowski. It's the original, it's the only image which was seen by St. Faustina. Um, Eugene Kazimierowski, he was an educated man. He was a mysterious man by many accounts and to many people. He was also a known Freemason. Uh, he lived in the town of Vilnius. He was hired by now blessed Father Michael Sapochko, who was St. Faustina's confessor and spiritual director. And uh, Jesus, um, Faustina told Father Sapochko that Jesus wanted him uh, to be her confessor, that he picked her. He, Jesus picked Father Sapochko. So Father Sapochko hires the artist, Eugene um, Kazimierowski, and um, he commissioned him to make this painting. Now, St. Faustina would go there to his workshop one or two times a week for about a six-month period. We're told that the meetings they had were not very spiritual in nature at all, but they were really technical in nature. And there was some tension uh, kind of be between the two, with the artist uh, no doubt being frustrated because Faustina was so important to her that the technical parts of this painting be kept right. She had such a firm image in her head of how Jesus appeared to her and had this and had directed this image uh, to be made. So this is an excerpt from a letter, again, written by Father Sapochko and uh, referenced in the same book, that Pillars of Fire in My Soul. Um, um, and here he quotes something which was written by Sister Faustina. She, she writes, Once, when I was at that painter's, referring to uh, Eugene, who's painting this image, I saw that it was not as beautiful as Jesus is. I became very sad but I hid that deep in my heart. When we left the painter, Mother Superior remained in the city to settle various matters, but I returned home by myself. Immediately, I made my way to the chapel and had a good cry. I said to the Lord, who will paint you as beautiful as you are? All of a sudden, I heard the words, not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush, is the greatness of this image, but in my grace. After its completion in 1934, the Kazmierowski painting hung in a convent near the church of St. Michael, where Father Sapochko was a rector. In her diary, Faustina wrote that Jesus told her that she should let Father Sapochko know that the proper place for the painting was in a church, not in the hallway of a convent. So the first public exposition of this painting was between the 26th and the 28th of April in 1935 in a church um, called the Gate of Dawn in Vilnius. Faustina indicated that she once saw Jesus come alive from this image as it was hanging in the church, with the rays that were coming from his heart penetrating the hearts of the people gathered there, the time Father Sapochko was preaching a sermon about God's mercy on Good Friday. In 1937, on the Sunday after Easter, um, which later we would know would become known as the Feast of Divine Mercy by Pope John Paul II. But uh, the painting was put on display beside the main altar in St. Michael's Church in Vilnius. This, the image, including small reproductions of it and, and various devotional materials, was used by Sapochko in promoting uh, the image of Divine Mercy and Divine Mercy devotion. In 1949, the Church of St. Michael in Vilnius it was closed and destined for destruction. Most works of art were stolen or destroyed. The image was left behind because it was considered to be of no artistic value. So again, this is a period after World War II uh, when Poland was taken over by communists and so much, so many churches were condemned, being torn down, used for other things, and they were getting rid of any type of religious artwork. However, this picture was left behind because it was considered to be of uh, poor, I guess, artistic quality, not so much in that it was painted, but I guess in the, uh, in the subject and its unusual, um, uh, unusual maybe image projection of our Lord. 
So in the 1950s, two members of the local Marian Sodality in Vilnius decided to purchase the image in secret uh, using pseudonyms, keeping their real identities secret. After purchase, it was moved to Nova Ruda in Belarus, and it was placed in a church there very high above the sanctuary. It stayed there through the 1970s. Un unfortunately, I learned that before that happened, when the ladies were, uh, before it made it into that church, the ladies were hiding it, and it was rolled up into, uh, the, the canvas was rolled up and it was put in an attic. So it was really bad. It wasn't, you know, on a stretcher. And it was also subject to a lot of temperature and humidity changes. So kind of like the worst thing that could happen to a painting on a canvas. But um, so eventually it got moved to Nova Ruta in Belarus, placed on the church very high above the sanctuary where it stayed through the 1970s. Because it was hung so high, it actually ended up helping to save the image because when the communists used the church, they turned it into a warehouse in the 1970s. They didn't bother to take the image down from the wall, probably because it was hung up so high and out of the way. In 1985, the image was finally transported back to Vilnius. So many people take this as a sign that God certainly wanted us to have it for it to you know, survive and be handed down to us. Eventually, it was given to an art restorer. Uh, the image had been painted over multiple times, dried out, was missing paint, cracked in places, filled with wax, rolled up, uh, and placed into that attic, as we said. But fortunately, the overpaint, so someone had painted at, at least, I'm sorry, I'm trying to brighten the, uh, brighten the image here for you. So at, at one point, someone had painted over a lot of what was originally there. Uh, when people saw this in the, uh, in the 1980s, and when the art restorer um, saw it, I mean, she was really taken aback. It, it, um, it didn't look so attractive. <laughs> but what she found when she removed that overlayer of paint, the original image that uh, that came out, um, it was so much actually so much different. The face of Christ looked, you know, a lot different, um, much less of a beard, but it really did appear different. The eyes appeared different. Uh, so fortunately, she was able to save it. She took off a little bit at a time um, and was able to see the original image, fill in cracks. And now there's a beautiful restoration of it that we have. What was discovered during this time was a similarity. A few people noticed this, that there seemed to be a similarity between this image of divine mercy and uh, the Shroud of Torn, the face image on the Shroud of Torn. So they were, they were looking at the face. And if you see the movie, uh, I believe it's called Faustina Love and Mercy, which came out last year. Um, but if you see that movie, they revealed a lot of things for the first time in there. Uh, they talk about they did forensic studies where they put together the faces, the face from this image, and they put it with the face image from the Shroud of Torin, and then they also put it, uh, they also put it together with the face image from. Sorry, I'm trying to pull this up. Oh gosh, I don't remember what it is, but it is a piece of cloth that was believed to have covered. I'm sorry, the veil of Oviedo, which is a piece of cloth that was believed to have covered Christ's head as he was on the cross until they took him down and then would have covered him with the shroud. So when they line up those three things, the, the version of the face from this version of the painting with the veil of Oviedo and then also with the shroud of Torin, they find a convergence on so many points of the face. It's incredible. The eyebrows, the cheekbones, the nose, the mouth. Um, and they say that the, you know, the chances of that just being accidental are like inf infinitesimal, right? So, so really, really small that that could happen mathematically. So it seems that there's something to that. However, despite that, right, this, this painting does not actually meet all the requirements from Father Sofochko's letter. For example, a lot of people would say that the face of Christ does not look very gracious and merciful. It looks a little more austere right? Especially if we compare it to uh, the next image that so many of us are used to seeing, right? A lot of people would say that has a lot more of the grace and merciful, uh, gracious and merciful look to it. Also, if we look at the rays, they don't come out towards the viewer. They clearly go down. Uh, but despite that, you know, we have all those things that match up with the Shroud of Torn. So it's very interesting. And this was also the one that Faustina would say that Jesus gave uh, approval to saying, as we heard in that quote, that it can't be perfect. So, all right, so that's image number one. 
Image number two. This is the Hyla Divine Mercy image painted by artist Adolf Hyla, who lived from 1897 to 1965. Hyla gave it to the Sisters of Mercy in Poland uh, in Thanksgiving that he and his family survived during World War II. Uh, there's a book called A Divine Mercy Resource by author Richard Toretto. It came out in 1910. He said that Hyla created this painting uh, five years after the death of Faustina in 1938 but under the direction of another one of her confessors, Joseph Andras. Now, clearly, Father, Blessed Father Sapochko was her uh, main confessor. So I believe that what he's saying is that there was another priest who would have heard confessions sometimes of St. Faustina. But I think the point being that Hyla indicated that he was given direction by um, a priest who knew Sister Faustina. So when the Sisters of Mercy received this from Mr. Hyla, they placed the image over the tomb of St. Faustina at their convent, and it can still be seen there today. This version uh, seems to be very popular in European and Latin American countries, but there's some aspects in this version which are also not completely in agreement with Father Sapochko's description of how it was to be. For example, uh, Christ's hand of blessing is raised above his shoulder. If we look back at the original image, you can see that one is consistent. The hand doesn't go above the shoulder. Um, also, Christ's gaze is directly at the viewer, right? Whereas in the original one, you can see that the gaze, the eyes are going down like a few feet in front of our Lord. So that's the difference. Uh, yet so many people take comfort in this, particularly because the gaze uh, of our Lord at, is at the viewer. Um, uh, the rays of mercy are perhaps still not shining outward enough towards the viewer. In other words, they seem to be going down, uh, just like on the original one. And also, the rays are not transparent so that you cannot see the clothing underneath, as uh, Father Sapochko indicated in his description. But uh, to be fair, in the original, they're not very transparent either. So, But a few things kind of miss the mark there, uh, if you will. Another thing is that in the description Faustina gave, the, ray, the rays were to be pa one pale ray uh, and one red ray, whereas in this one, it's blue. You know, it's like a blue colored water instead of a, a pale colored water, you know, coming out like on the original. All right, the, th the third image we're gonna talk about is painted by uh, Robert Skemp in 1982. This has an interesting history. Uh, this one was painted on wood and is very popular in the Philippines, especially. It was given to blessed, then blessed, uh, he wasn't blessed, I'm sorry. It was given to Pope John Paul II, while he's still alive, who in turn gave it to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Tanzania. You can see this image um, every day on TV in the EWTN chapel. This image was commissioned to represent Jesus as walking through the door in the upper room, as well as to have the rays going out in all directions. You'll notice that the rays are transparent so that you can see uh, Christ behind them, right? And clearly they are going out towards us as we look at it, towards the viewer. Um, let's see, if we take a look at it though, and the hand, let's see, the hand does a good job, right? It doesn't go above the shoulder, which is good. However, the eyes are clearly looking out at us, at the viewer, rather than down on the ground as Faustina subscribed. We still have the, the left foot going forward, which is pretty consistent in all of the images. One thing that is important to, to point out, um, important to Faustina, is that she said that it was to be a dark background, so that, like in this first image, so that without Christ, who is the light, right, there is a complete absence of light. So it's supposed to be like Christ coming out from the Holy of Holies, Christ coming out from um, a place that if he is removed without him, there is nothing. So Christ is saying, without me, uh, the soul is empty. And so we've lost that in these other, uh, in these other two images. Now, you might be thinking that there's maybe an image that you have uh, is missing. 
There was a fourth image commissioned by the Marians of the Immaculate Conception by Kathleen Weber. It's similar to this Hyla image, and uh, I believe she used that as a model, except it has a blue background. Uh, and she's also done a pretty good job of having the rays be transparent. I didn't include that just because it's not one of the images that um, is, a, is approved for, has ecclesial approval for display in churches and dissemination to the faithful. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. I mean, the, the Marian fathers had that uh, commissioned, um, but uh, they're ju it's just not one of the approved ones. So I really didn't want to, you know, put it up or talk about it. Uh, because there's so many. So I would really encourage you, I learned a lot about these from the Marians of the Immaculate Conception on their website. They're also copyright holders for the images, and they really pride themselves in having a ministry for this artwork because Christ really wanted it to be disseminated. So you can see permissions on there for using them um, in various capacities, um, where you don't even need permission if you use them one time here and there, but you can also have the, let me go back to the original one there, but you can also have them, um, uh, you can print them out. They have one where you can print out this image, the original one for free in various sizes. You can save it, uh, but then also you can get them very inexpensively ordered and shipped out to you so that you can have them in your home and use them in your church and different things like that. So that's at thedivinemercy.org. Thedivinemercy.org talks all about the Divine Mercy devotion. And then they have a link to uh, part of their website where they have all the images. You can learn more about the Marians there as well. So I hope you enjoyed uh, joining us today for this broadcast. I really enjoyed it because I learned so much about the history of the images. I thought I knew a lot about them, but I really did not at all. So it's been an adventure and there's a lot more to learn on there. Again, if you want to check out thedivinemercy.org. Hope that you'll join us every day, the National Center for Padre Pio at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where we do the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. If you like this program, there's some other ones. We have a Divine Mercy 101. It, it's much more than just the prayers. That's one of the programs. We also have a program called Seal the Doors, because the Marians of uh, the Immaculate Conception are encouraging us, especially during this time uh, of the coronavirus pandemic and quarantines, that we seal the door with those images. We'd like to get you out some of these. We were gifted by a generous donor a whole lot of these cards that have, as you can see, the original image on them and have How to Say the Divine Mercy Chaplet on the back. Uh, if you just reach out to us at padrepo.org or call us at 610-845-3000, we'd like to get you out one of these, as well as a Miraculous Medal, which Padre Pio used to give out to people as well. So thank you so much. May God bless you. We hope you that uh, if you're if you're watching this after the coronavirus uh, pandemic is over, we hope you'll come up and uh, and see us real soon. Um, if you are watching us during the coronavirus pandemic, we can't have you indoors yet, uh, but we would. But we're really hoping that we're going to be open soon. Either way, we hope that we get to meet you. That you'll come up to the home of Padre Pio in the USA, located just about north of the um, sorry, an hour north by car in the city of Philadelphia. May God bless you and all of your loved ones, and St. Pio of Pietrelcina, pray for us.